Straight from Silicon Valley, three generations of venture capitalists and one guest judge equals Meet the Dreamers! Imagine that, they wanted another season. Entrepreneurs pitched billion dollars lost every year. We were both wandering aimlessly. The judges asked the questions. So what's special about you guys? Why will this stay on your platform? But here is the twist. You, the viewers, get to invest for equity. This is your chance to own a piece of the next big idea. To invest in a company, go to meetthedrapers.com. Find them in this week's Entrepreneurs, and you can invest. You can share in their future success. At the end of the season, the entrepreneurs with the most funds raised are brought back for the season finale, where Tim Draper invests in his favorite company. Become an entrepreneur because it's easy to get money. And that didn't happen in Wall Street. To meet the Drapers. I'm Jesse. This is my dad, Tim. This is Andy Tang, who's our incredible world renowned venture capitalist from Draper Associates, and he's also CEO of Draper University. And today, for the first time ever on Meet the Drapers, we have Q Motiwala, who runs Draper Nexus. And Draper Nexus operates here and in Tokyo. They have a lot of corporate investors, so it's sort of an interesting expertise looking at these entrepreneurs through a corporate lens. It's going to be fun to have Hugh talking with us. So this is, we got a whole Draper gang here. Yes. That's right. Right? Yeah. Today we wanted to talk a little bit about company culture. Or what cultures do you look for? What do you think about when you're doing a company culture? Before you even go there, you got to set your own firm's culture. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the fun culture, how are you going to go tell the entrepreneur? We've done some unique things. We've tried to keep a very flat culture. We try to have a lot of meets where our Japan team comes to the U.S. We rent a big house. We'll divide our teams and do cooking and have cooking competitions. We might do a 14, 15 mile hike. What can you cook? <laughs> Indian curry is what they assign me all Oh, oh perfect. <laughs> What we try to tell them is don't do things that are going to demotivate them. So we just try to apply the same things that we have. My first job was in the 90s. So I joined a big company, Motorola. And there, it's all about what you could do for the company. But now, you know, when I work with my team, you know, they're really the millennial generation. I really have to start thinking a little bit differently. This is a very collaborative environment. And I started thinking about sort of this idea of how do we make your job so it align with the company goal? It's not all about the company. It's about what the employees could learn, how they could grow. If you take a genuine interest in each one of them, it could come back. This is clearly my bias, and it's the way I like to manage it, which is driving a vision forward, but not giving too much guidance to the team as to how they're going to get there so that the team has to think for themselves. They're more engaged because it was their decision to jump and do this. So I like the great visionary leader, the Elon Musk or the Steve Jobs saying, no, we have to have one button or the, the car has to go 600 miles instead of 200 miles and then leaves it up to the engineers to go figure it all out. Then everybody seems to have a little bit more fun. They're more excited about it. Dad. I love that. But I think in general, Yay. <laughs> I think in general also this something- This may be a first on camera. <laughs> something you've taught me and same with my grandfather is just to lead with positivity and really create that positive vibe around everybody. And so if you're excited about the vision and the direction you guys are going, the team will be on yeah. board. You have to try to say yes more often than you say no. The caveat there is that you don't do that with entrepreneurs. I was about to say, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, you you gotta say, say no. no a lot That's to those. Good. I completely agree. So should we... That's two. two. So what do you think? Should we bring on our first entrepreneur? Sounds great. But first, let's take a look behind the scenes. My name is Kobe Wu. I am the founder and CEO of Visual Technologies. Visual, in its simplest form, is a marketplace to put advertising in the window. Visual started in B-School. I was at a competition and we won this idea. At the time, it was just a marketplace, no technology behind it. The model itself has been doing what it's supposed to do, I think. We were able to build and make relationships with people, no problem. The hard part kicks in when you don't have the money and you don't have a team that's committed to the business because you're not paying 
paying them full time. That was hard to kind of figure out how to get people to buy into the dream. And after a while I started learning how to actually convey to people that this is something that you could be a part of as well. You can create something for your family. I think Jesse and I might have some stuff in common. She seems to be into girl power and wanting to kind of understand how we work and our needs. I, I think she might have the most interest in visual, or if not visual, me. <laughs> Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Give us your pitch. Thank you so much. My name is Kobe Wu. I'm the founder and CEO of Visual Technologies. The premise of Visual is very simple. What we do is we take vacant commercial real estate, as much as we can get our hot little hands on, create a supply of it, and then present an aggregate of this supply to advertisers, media buyers, brands, etc., and say, hey, put an ad in it that looks like this. Behind this ad, we have a very simple sensor in window one like this that looks outside and counts the number of people walking by. It tells you if there's as many faces that are looking directly at you, how long they're looking, male-female breakdown, sentiment, and even approximate age range. The dashboard of analytics provides you with an easy and digestible outlook. You can take action and make decisions based on that, and that works for both advertisers and the property owners. To date, we've been making some decent traction across the last 18 months or so. We are looking at growing our supply in New York City and in Los Angeles. We're going to look at a third market in the next few months to start presenting that to advertisers. And that's about it. So this is between the time that somebody leaves the space and the time that somebody else leases the space. You try to grab that window. Ideally. Now, the owner may want to put something in the window that says for lease. Correct. Right? Window. We will work within that space and give them a footprint if they desire. But typically, because we're paying them for that time, they're willing to take their broker information, either put it to the side or take it down for the 30, 60, 90 days that the ad is in window. So the ad, is it a sticker ad and then that is sort of embedded in it? Or is it a projection? It is a sticker. Okay. We cut a little quarter size hole in it so that the eyeball can look right out. It's pretty invisible and it's just peeking out and looking at it. It's a very simple installation process. Plug it in and go. And these Great. are best in big urban settings. Ideally, yeah. We're finding a lot of interest with some mall owners, which are a different model for us in terms of physical logistics because it's a mall and there is strictly pedestrian, not also street traffic. But it's also very interesting to us because it helps those property owners actually understand how many people are entering the space, how many people are dwelling in certain areas more frequently than maybe others. And it gives you a lot of insights on maybe even what kind of occupants might do best in that space. This becomes cyclical over time because if you fill all that space and it's a big boom time and all these spaces are completely filled, then you have no inventory. And when it falls apart, you have all the inventory. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny conundrum, but it's actually over the past decade or so, there's always been about a 10% vacancy rate across the country. Right now, we're seeing an incline to 14% because retail it tends to be declining at the moment. Visual helps to offset that downtime, and it'll really help property owners maintain some sort of income while this is changing. Yeah, how much are we talking What's the scale of this uh, income for the owner? Does it move the needle for the... It can. It could be something as simple that we offset their property taxes for the year. If it's a very popular location, we can make that 10 times over, especially if it's a very high profile location, like say something like Times Square. That place is going to be empty for 15, 18, maybe even 24 months. And in places like New York City, where I'm from, a lot of vacancies are open for 36 months. That's a long time to be not making any revenue. What's your split? How does this? Not 50-50. We're getting away with 60, up to 35% to the landlords. And then how big's the market for all of this space? If you grabbed all the empty space, what would the market size be for everything? In everything across the US, a good 92,000 locations. We could easily occupy $20,000 per location, and that's on the low end. For larger windows, we charge incrementally by square foot. The total number would be probably be looking in the 1.8 billion. Woohoo! <laughs> it's good you're a good salesperson because I think you've got to sell the landlord mm -hmm. and you've got to sell the advertiser. People have to physically put these posters up. It, they do, and that's the Does easy Does the part. landlord do it? No, it's the landlords don't have to do anything. They just okay. have to say yes. Say yes, get money. Correct. Yeah. How much revenue did you say you were making annually? 
We've only been around for about 18 months. Okay. So in our first six months, we made about 250. We're looking at about three to 500 in the next three months. Okay. So that we will be able to claim a million dollars at the end of the year, knock on wood. Now, why raise money at all? It, lo it looks like you got kind of an interesting, nice Thank you. cottage yeah. business going, and it probably doesn't need a lot of capital. Why bring on an investor who gives you pains and <laughs> makes well, you your life what? miserable when you've got this great thing? Yeah. But this is why I'm raising money. It's because of this little piece right here. When I can bring in data, this data becomes interesting market research information. I can flip this and provide insights to different business industries, and I want to grow this component. Terrific. Great. Well, thank, thank you, you so much cool. for coming thank to you. meet the Drapers. Thank you so much. Thank All right. Thank you so much. It was Thanks nice to meet time. you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. I think it went really well. All of the judges were, you know, very engaged the entire time, asking tons of questions, even kind of interrupting me a little bit here and there, which I always find is a good sign. Seasoned folks like the Drapers, they're going to ask questions that they know are going to make the business go or the challenges or pitfalls that I might face. And I feel like I answered them effectively to the point where they are like, okay, she's, she's got some... She's got some chutzpah, she knows how to make this go a little bit. I don't want to get too cocky, but I think it went well enough. <laughs> Visual is at a stage now where we're ramping our product development. And what we want to do is really create an aggregate of data that can then be resold and can grow our business beyond just the point of entry today, which is the marketplace and licensing the windows for advertisers. What we're really doing is creating the data. And if you want to be a part of our team, invest in Visual's campaign on Republic. So what did we all think? What did you think, Hugh? This looks, you know, really good. I think instead of thinking of windows just in the malls, I'd like to think of windows of Uber drivers, you know, taxis and things like that. It could, really, it could be really big, but not sure if this is for the VC model. I the felt way the exact is. same way. I wasn't sure if this was a VC investment. She's dealing with marketing dollars. It is a pretty cash-heavy business. I feel like she could sell a lot and be able to fund the company based upon that pretty quickly. I like the idea of a problem looking for solution versus is investing in a sexy solution looking for a problem. I find that once she could get the revenue, the cash, she could probably f find the right tech talent to implement. So the idea of that little camera and data is, is pretty interesting. So yes, as is, it's probably not a venture backable model. So it's, it's an interesting prospect for a year from now, I think. I really liked her. Me I too. thought she really had something. That strength and intelligence and drive. And a lot of companies have done really well with alternative ways to advertise. Uh, Focus, Focus Media, Media yeah. in China yeah. was just putting these little TV screens in elevators. Yeah. Right. It's now worth 10 or $20 billion, right. I think. And it's probably good for a crowd fund because as a venture model, it's a tough one because you're saying there are no barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. It's an ad model that's kind of odd. And this is a tough way to run a business, but if it starts working, it's going to be pretty big. Okay, well, should we I think vote? we need to go to the visual. First, you go to the crystal ball, and you just see what the crystal ball sends you. What is it sending What's you? the, so you know. got the energy, and then you go, okay, I got it. Okay, Ooh, okay should we vote? Ball. Yeah, so absolutely. So here's how we vote. We do thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs all around, and then you go up or down or middle or whatever you're feeling. Would you invest in this company? Visual. Thumbs, thumbs up. Visual. Thumbs up. Thumbs, thumbs down, down. Thumbs, thumbs all, all around. around. I liked her. I was the most optimistic here. Wow. That is really interesting. This is like a two thirds, three quarters. It's in that <laughs> yeah. you know, point seven range. <laughs> This is up to you. We can vote. We can, you see how we feel, but how do you feel about Visual? Do you want to own a piece of this amazing business? You can invest $10, $1,000, or you could just vote and support them. Go to meetthedrapers.com. But first, let's take a look at what's happening behind the scenes. My name is Ladar Levison. I'm the CEO and founder of LavaBit. I'm Richard Delgado, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of LavaBit. We're all about providing and advancing secure communications. Our focus is on building a federated encryption standard that will protect people's email. We've traded our uh, privacy for convenience, and we're trying to take back that power. The biggest challenge was probably with the Department of Justice over the encryption key for the company because they wanted to get into Edward Snowden's email account. In turning it over, I would have compromised the privacy. 
to see like, active users. So instead, I decided to suspend operations and rewrite the mail protocols. And that just presents all sorts of technical challenges to live in this interconnected world that we're in, but still do it in a way where you retain control right. over who can read your messages. One of the reasons that we're certainly here and so excited is to meet with Tim Draper. Uh, his interest in cryptocurrencies and just being a trailblazer and pioneer for all things tech. We think he's the natural fit for us for an investor. He already has a background in email yeah. and he loves cryptography. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. So give us your pitch. Thank you. Um, my name's Ladar Levison. I'm the CEO and founder of Lavabit. This is my co-founder, Richard Delgado. He handles all the money and stuff. Um, <laughs> our, our job is about building platforms that make encryption automatic and accessible to the average person. Last year, there were 74 trillion emails sent between approximately 3.7 billion people. Email is the most important written form of communication on this planet. And yet, you get more privacy and more security by dropping a postcard in the mailbox down the street than you do by sending an email. Our job is to build a new generation of protocols, because you have to remember, email was created before the World Wide Web. It was created all the way back in the 1970s, and those same protocols are with us today. Online terminals are devices through which a person communicates directly with a computer, either to give it information or to ask for and receive the results of a transaction. Security is really an afterthought. So what we set about doing three years ago was reinventing those protocols. And I think we've done that. We've created a new generation of protocols that's more secure, more versatile than anything on the market today. So we're out here seeking capital so that we can expand our development team and really build out our full implementation. Because we want to go beyond email. We sort of see email as the heart of your digital identity. How does the technology work? Typing in an email, I'm about to send an email, I send an email, goes, where is your security piece? And then where are all these other pieces that you're talking about? So what we've done is we've integrated the ability for your software to look up the encryption key of the person that you're sending a message to and tell you, does this person support end-to-end -end encryption or not? But fundamentally, it looks up to see if the other domain supports encryption. And if it's a secure domain, your mail client will tell you. And if you're about to send out an unencrypted message, it'll tell you that too. You know, we like to think that if Hillary Clinton was using our software, there may not have been a scandal during the last election. So the Lavabit story is very well documented. Edward Snowden cared enough to use a service called Lavabit to protect his message. And so the government came and said, we want all the incoming and outgoing information from his account. Ladar, facing this circumstance, made the really tough decision to shut down his entire company to try to actually deliver a degree of security and privacy and to protection. his customers. We fundamentally believe that everyone deserves the innate right to privacy and freedom, and that's what we are. We're freedom fighters, essentially. All one has to do is look at the jaw-dropping headlines um, that we've just seen to see exactly how dire these problems are. And that's what we're trying to do, is restore privacy back into um, modern communications. Isn't security and convenience a zero-sum game as far as consumers go? It, it's a difficult problem. Sure. You know, there's this trade-off. They say the more automatic you make something, the less secure it is. And that's why it took us three years, because we really had to develop things from the ground up. And I like to think that what we did is gave you the most amount of security you can get while keeping it automated. In case you sent me an email, if I had to forward your email to Tim or Andy, would they be able to see that email or no? Because you forwarded it, it would be wrapped in another layer of encryption which would encapsulate the information necessary to decrypt the original message, compatible. as long as you were on a compatible system. As a user, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, great, it's going to be secure and all that stuff, but I'm going to keep getting these messages. Would you like to send this on a non-secure thing? If I were in the CIA, that would matter a lot more than just being in the venture business. You say that until you get hacked, and then you'll be coming right, to us have been. in a hurry. I'm surmising that if we were on the Microsoft Exchange, mm -hmm. maybe some of us on Gmail, I'm surmising that the mail server needs to be lava bit compatible. Yes, at, at so, the most so you, basic level. So you probably have to do some major business development deals. Because these guys mm -hmm. kind of And we've, are, we've those, already right? started that process. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, we're also working on an Exchange plugin. There are ways of integrating these protocols into other platforms. Mm -hmm. And what right we really now, yeah. hope is to develop our platform and use the security and encryption as a way to disrupt the existing players 
like Exchange, like the big cloud mm -hmm. providers. How do you make money? Well, we have a subscription model right now. Oh, you have on, customers? On yes, yeah. we have over 100,000 customers right now. Why did you right. decide to restart the business after shutting it down? When we shut yeah. it down, we didn't walk away from the problem. We put on our thinking caps and tried to develop a solution that would solve this problem permanently for everybody. We spent two or three years developing and documenting the solution, and now we're moving into the implementation phase. What we need to do now is build marketable products that the average person can use. Terrific. Well, thank you so Great. much thank for you. coming thank to meet the Drake. Thank you. I've seen you. Thanks, guys. So nice to thank meet you. you. It's a one of the great takeaways that I have from this is they're interested in, in our platform technology. Tim is certainly invested in this space, so this is very top of mind. You know, I developed a server-based encryption program, which is what led to the whole Snowden litigation in 2013. 2004, I was 10 years ahead of the curve, and when I started working on this in 2014, I was once again 10 years ahead of the curve. In other words, in, in another eight years, 50% of the world is going to be using our technology or something like it. We're a, certainly a startup, but we have this very long and storied history that revolved around an important problem. We're poised to change the world. Um, all we need is the resources to hire the development team to finish building out this platform and bring it to the masses. We like the idea of the fact that we're building a technology by the people for the people, and we like the idea of Republic giving us an opportunity to raise the funds to do it from the people. What the crisis in 2013 taught me is that the way we think about security today doesn't work, and it sent me back to the drawing board to build this next generation. Well, so what did we all think? Q, when do you start us off? It's a really interesting idea. You know, we are seeing there's some challenges. They got to standardize their particular protocols and then make sure all the servers talk that protocol because if you've got only 20% of the people doing this, it's not going to work. I like how committed they were because it sounds like they were on a mission to do this. It failed, and back when you're, they were in the school days, they've been on this for a long time. Yeah, yeah and it kept going. So I thought that really got my attention. Hey, these guys are committed, so if you invest in them, you're not going to lose their, your money because they They'll make give it happen. up. Yes. Where you look at it as commitment, I kind of looked at it as like, well, this is the way yes. we're going to go. And so I don't know if that's good as founders, as culture. I think they could be a little more open, but they also understand this space. Um, and I do think that we need more secure email, but I mean, it's a big undertaking. I did like their commitment to the mission. And I like that this is one of the big problems. Email is so important. I think giving it the 15-year test, is this thing going to be alive in 15 years or is it going to be important in 15 years? I did get the viral part of this. This is going to be very viral. What do you guys think? Uh, do you want to vote for them? Do you like Lava Bit? Go to meetthedrapers.com because we are the only show on television where you can invest in the companies. We want to yeah. get the vibe up yes. from the crystal ball. I feel like we have to say something like a bibbity bobbity boo or something. Lava bit, lava bit. Yeah, lava, lava bit. bit. Chili beanie. <laughs> Did you just say chili beanie? Chili beanie. Okay. <laughs> I got the energy. Okay, I got did you it. get it? I got it. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> okay, what do we think, guys? Thumbs up, up thumbs down, down, thumbs all, all around. around. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. Kind of I thought you were cool. into it. <laughs> no, I'm into the market. I think identity wins here. Yeah, I think you were thinking in the 20 years, we're thinking of maybe 5, 10. There yes. Be some... Well, let's welcome our next entrepreneur. But first, let's take a look at what's going on behind the scenes. I'm Amanda Greenberg. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ballooner. Before founding Ballooner, I was a public health researcher in DC. And it was really in that role that I noticed a huge problem. Business tools don't actually follow well-studied research for how you get ideas and information out of a group. We're really amplifying all these unheard voices, new ideas, and bringing those to the forefront from a very level playing field. I think that Tim will have a really interesting take on it. I think that he's going to connect to companies needing this data and this information and the best ideas. I I think that Jesse will connect as well to um, just some of the obstacles around gender bias that we all encounter. It's always hard to tell. Well, welcome to Meet the Drapers. So give us your pitch. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm Amanda Greenberg. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ballooner. Before founding Ballooner, I was a public health researcher, and it was really in that role that I noticed a huge problem with the way that we work. Our business tools and processes are broken. They don't address the way our brains actually work in a group setting. They don't account for things like group dynamics, corporate culture, or a fear of failure. And as a result, companies don't have access to the best ideas or the right data. And this costs companies billions in bad decision-making, stalled innovation, and wasted time. So we built Ballooner, a platform based on science and research to address how humans actually share information and make decisions. How Ballooner works is someone starts a Ballooner, which is a question, topic, or prompt. They invite a group. That group then goes together through a special stage workflow where they're anonymously creating and launching balloons, discussing those balloons, completing a merit-based vote without groupthink, and then seeing the ballooned insights or um, ideas. And then although Ballooner is anonymous start to finish, users are able to remove anonymity and claim their contributions. Ballooner is used across industries and our customers include Capital One, Hyatt, BMW, the LA Angels, and more. We also have upcoming pilots with both Google and Airbnb. We're at 250K ARR with a million in projected expansions by the end of the year. We've built and designed apps for IBM, Bloomberg, and the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama? Yeah. <laughs> what is the Dalai Lama using it for? Well, we built um, an app previously, a Tibetan language learning app for the Dalai Lama. So if a CEO has a bad idea, people could say, hey, this is not a good idea without revealing who you are. Exactly. So you have the best yeah. ideas going to the top. Oh, wait, so interface. it's a survey. Somewhat. It's like a so survey. Very much, yes, so there's a surveying component at the beginning where people aren't able to see each other's responses. And then they can all talk about exactly. it later. It's like, hey, wow, 60% voted this way. I thought about it this way. I got to learn what they're all thinking. It's used a lot of different ways. So for example, used by a national sports team for scouting. So leveling out that playing field. So interns and more senior scouts, mm -hmm. their picks are seeing the same without the bias of like who's submitting that person. But why wouldn't I want a senior scout's point of view over a junior scout's point? So for a lot of different reasons. Like one is, you know, people gravitate toward the CEO and oftentimes that results in false start. Like we've all seen group think mm -hmm. where someone has an initial idea, everyone says they agree with it, they don't really agree with it, and it starts to move forward, it ends up being a false start. Or but a senior scout is going to have a lot more experience and a lot better understanding of what might end up turning out to be a good player because they've had the experience of saying, somebody just like this, we had the same problem, but we overcame it with this. Yeah, I mean, so there's definitely elements of expertise that are necessary. So one of the things we're working on for V2 are like expert networks within companies. It's a survey. We don't consider ourselves our sur a survey and our customers don't consider us a survey. Okay. So there's a collaboration element, a voting element. I would say it's more geared toward business collaboration. It's Slack with anonymity. In an enterprise, mm -hmm. in Slack, I just took out the title and the name of the person. So what have you really done besides anonymizing the person? So one is randomization. So in Slack, if you like post the question, right, everyone just like, it goes on forever. People just write responses. There's no way to really come to a consensus there. So we help to surface all of those insights, all of those ideas in a much more streamlined way. But that's just more features. You know, I think maybe what you're getting at is, is this something Slack could just implement? Yeah, so a very different flow. So it starts around this ballooner, and then people are able to discuss them in a different way, randomize, vote. What's your background? Have you run anything before, and how did that go? Yeah, so I was a public health researcher before. I designed and developed um, national behavior change campaigns. So working for the government? Yeah, public somewhat. Health outside research. the government, but for the mm -hmm. government. Yeah, so I completed my undergraduate at Dartmouth College, and then I went straight to graduate school, graduate first in my class from the top public health school in the nation. I was a researcher and then I planned to go to medical school, but I became obsessed with this problem and left that role and started Ballooner. This is what I was guessing. You were first in your class, but nobody was listening. You <laughs> knew everything, <laughs> but nobody was listening to you. No, so opposite. So what happened is when I was a researcher, I was trying to get ideas and feedback and information out of my yeah. team. So then I tried like everything available to me. So I sent surveys, I scheduled meetings, they would get louder, more senior voices would dominate conversations. I posting on Slack or send an email and it would just like Well, you go should have forever. been in the private sector. Yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. The government I know. workers are not really anxious to, you know, participate but in But then your... I started getting like these one-off phone calls and emails from people who were like more junior than me and they were sharing these insights that were like game-changing. And I was like, why are you coming to me versus everything I put out there? And they were like, I'm new to my role. I didn't know if my ideas were good enough. And so through that, I was like, okay, I'm a researcher. I dug into the research and was just shocked. Like all these business tools and processes we use, we just accept, even though they don't take into account all these different issues with group dynamics or 
corporate culture or how humans actually work. You talk about culture, so what's your co-founding team and what's the company culture you're trying to instill? We're a five-person team. My co-founder went to Carnegie Mellon. He was a full-stack developer designer. How did you meet your co-founder? We're married co-founders. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so very much a great complimentary fit and match. That's How's that problem. going? Yeah. <laughs> it's great. And you're the CEO. Yes, yeah. And he's... Noah's the CTO. CTO. Yep. That actually may work. I think it's that a huge advantage. That may work because you have separate responsibilities. If you disagree on something, who wins out? I win out. Yeah, yeah. And that's how we've always done it. You know, the way it works in my family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've always done it like that. Like, we'll, you know, have a disagreement and then, yeah, we figure it out. Do but. you have anything to fall back on? Like, you run out of money and, like, what do you do? I mean, we're pretty gritty and unstoppable. So we're selling, we're doing well, we're growing our company. And yeah, we believe in what we're doing and we believe in our mission. So we've never really thought about it like that. We see our happy customers and we see the results we're getting and we hear their accolades. And so we know that we're going in the right direction. Well, good. Thank you so right. much. Terrific. Thank Thanks you so for much. coming to meet Thanks the Drapers. <laughs> so nice to meet you. you. Pleasure meeting you. Thank you. It's fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think it went really well. Um, really interesting questions. It was great to share. Uh, just more about our company, more about our vision, more about our traction. I love seeing different people's takes on what we're doing. It's always exciting as a founder to share your vision, your mission, your company, your traction, etc., and get feedback, um, especially from like world-class VCs. You know, we've had investors who I didn't think would be interested at all, who ended up being our, our largest champions and backers. We're really bringing something new to the workplace, and we're really focused on creating a meritocracy to drive better outcomes, decisions um, for the world. Well, so what do we think? What do we think? Andy, why don't you start us off? The part I really liked was when Tim asked her who was in charge, and she says she was. So without hesitation, that was all in. So that was great. The, the product itself, I have noticed there is a trend of corporate culture collaboration tools. So I like that. But I do think it's still, still a little bit early in that they seem a little bit of feature yeah. on the Slack. So, totally. So overall, you know, I think it's interesting, but still lots of um, diligence to go through. It was really difficult not to see the product, I think, because True. she was a, a fantastic founder and I would bet on her. She seems yeah. amazing. But yeah, it seems like a feature. I feel like for years and years and years, these anonymous platforms have existed. Right. So it's nothing like life changing. Even though she's saying they're not a survey company, I think they are. That's one of the things that they do. Yeah. And so I wasn't super into the idea. I just love this particular CEO. She was just fantastic. This innovation in large companies, whether it's the Cisco's or Google, Google is an exception. All those companies that are just dying, no new ideas. This is exactly in the trend line. But they just need to change the way they're going to go sell. I could imagine being a leader of a business and thinking, what's everybody thinking about down there? Any interesting ideas? And occasionally putting out a balloon or so that interesting things might rise to the top. And those big businesses that are all kind of top down and lots of people working, but just not really giving the input that they should. This is sort of an interesting way to get that input up. So I think that the business has a possibility, but she is a force of nature. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd bet for her, but I certainly wouldn't bet against her. So true. With that, I think we should consult our crystal ball, yes. don't you? Yes, I think. The, oh, this, this is, is the a big a balloon do, 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 here. Do, 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 do. We might not need to touch the... Balloon. 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 No, I don't think I can major. reach it, but I'm feeling the force. Are we going to <laughs> fund her? Thumbs, thumbs up, up, thumbs down, down thumbs, thumbs all, all around. around. I'm undecided. I'm way up. It's a founder versus business oh, thing for me. Oh, we got one for you. Look at that. We got wow. one sort of no down. thumb sideways. No, no, one. I'm you're, you're a little yeah. down. You're a little up. I'm, I'm way up. Well, there you have it. But you get to decide. It's up to you. Do you want to vote for Ballooner? Would you like to own a piece of Ballooner? Go to meetthedrapers.com and you can invest. You should stay tuned to listen to my dad's crypto chat up next. So I'm here with Hope Liu. Hope is listed as one of the top five rock stars, Forbes magazine, in crypto. And she went to MIT for her MBA. And then from the MIT Media Lab, she came up with this brilliant idea that crypto XM chain. And XM chain is bringing the crypto world to all of the supply chain. 
Tell me about um, Singapore. That apparently is a big part of how uh, yeah. how your company got going, right? Uh, so we actually started um, in 2015 back in MIT. Before that, I was working in Singapore. I was uh, in <laughs> investment banking. I was trying to look forward to what's going to happen in the next five or ten years, or maybe 20 years. If information technology is advanced enough, what we're doing now in operations department at a bank doesn't make sense at all. It can be completely yeah, replaced. Yeah, so you're thinking crypto might be replacing the banks in maybe five or ten years. Absolutely. And mm. so I've got to make this this switch quickly at yeah. this time. Yeah. yeah. Um, apparently, you mm. had some difficulty because you're female. Yeah. So tell us about that. Because when we started the idea, that was back in 2015. Supply chain and the global trade is like so inefficient. But we couldn't raise money because it was hard to persuade small business or large company um, to understand like how a blockchain can actually become adopt adoptable in the enterprise world while they have so many legacy system and ongoing process. Okay, so who did put money in? A venture is called Blockseed Ventures. Yeah, so he put one million dollar in us. And that was enough for you to go ahead and put the, the yeah. legal yeah, platform yeah. together in Singapore? Yes, so it was really great that uh, we, we got the opportunity to basically talk to the local government, the Singapore uh, local government. And, and in the end, um, they were able to review our case directly. So I think that is actually the reason why, you know, a lot of the companies are actually moving to Singapore is because of the, um, the level of clarity you can get. Uh, so smaller governments are probably a better idea than bigger governments. So I think smaller governments now have better uh, opportunity to play regulatory arbitrage into their favor and attract Absolutely. I actually Companies. think that mm -hmm. all these governments are in competition with each other for people like you. Yeah. So then you were able to raise twenty million dollars mm -hmm. on your token on your token right. sale, not an ICO because you didn't open it yes, up to the public. Correct. correct. It was a private sale. Yeah. And and the people who invested were all um, were they supply chain people? It's a utility token, so it's very important that. Um, the most of the token holders, their incentive is aligned with the long term of the project. So actually, then I had to interview everyone who's interested. I tell them to justify why you will either be ah, supply, chain, fun. supply chain It's always user, great or, to have it go the other way. Right? Yeah, it's mind blowing. But I think for me, I, we try the best to identify who A, has the supply chain background, B, could add the strategic value to the platform in the future. It was, it was still a hard process. Yeah. Great. Well, Hope, it is great to have you here on Meet the Drapers. And when you're a guest on Meet the Drapers, we adopt you. Ooh. So your your name is now Hope She Draper. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Welcome to the family. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, if you, if you buy a piece of a ballooner, does that pop the balloon? <laughs> it grows the balloon. <laughs> We've just had three really interesting companies. And so what do you think? You know, did you have a favorite? Yeah, it was interesting when we started off, uh, our conversation was with culture. And so that theme is at the back of my head. And from that perspective, I would just pick Amanda. I mean, she was uh, out of the three, how she would set the culture for the organization, that infectious enthusiasm and a go-getter attitude. She's my favorite. And her company is all about culture too. Right. It's supporting True. culture yes. in a way. Oh, well, that's interesting. I wonder as her business grows, will she be using her own product? <laughs> That's I a hope good so. question you could have asked. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> right now there's four people, so then there's no need for anonymity. Right, I think we know who said it. <laughs> I, as far as culture goes, I, I do like the first um, CEO. I do like this uh, business leader at the top, kind of sets the direction of the business, knows where the customer's problems are, and then let's figure out a solution to meet those problems. So I, I do like that kind of culture where everything is very exacting. I liked her and I liked Ballooner. I liked both founders, both businesses I thought needed a little work or I needed to learn a little more about them, but those are the two I would bet on today. Let's do that. Let's just say you've got $1,000 and you've got those three companies. What do you do with your $1,000? I put it on all on Amanda. All on Ballooner. 
Yeah, because she'll figure it out. It's probably Ballooner, the go-to market is probably wrong, but she'll go figure it out on how to pivot it and get back in. I think I'd go 50-50 on Ballooner versus Visual. I think I would do that. I think I'd probably go between the email company and Ballooner and the split I think I'll probably do more on the ballooner side, maybe 60 to 80 percent, and then take a 20 percent flyer on the email company because if if that does take off, yeah. it's a big big market. Well, yeah, yeah, I would probably do about 80 percent with ballooner, and I would probably put 10 percent on lava bit just because email it could be just a yeah. huge yeah. business, and then another 10 percent on visual. 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 So you're saying the entrepreneurs today were pretty great. They were all worth thinking about investing in. Yes. Absolutely. And this final entrepreneur with Ballooner just blew my socks off. Yeah, she was You know, great. if the other two weren't so compelling, I would have said 100% behind her. Wow. Well, what do you think? Go to meetthedrapers.com. So, Q, it's been great having you here. Thank you and so when, much. And when we have a guest on Meet the Drapers, we adopt you. So you are now Q a Draper. Q Welcome Draper. to the family. Q Bring it in, Q Draper. You're the first <laughs> Draper. Well You're actually the second Draper that, whose name starts with a Q. Is that right? Yeah, Andy's absolutely. Andy's already in the Andy right. Andy right. Well, <laughs> <we're not laughs> it. See us see, next see time. See us next time on, on Meet, Meet the, the Drapers. Drapers. Do, 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 All right. All right. What is Gotta go with the flow. Who's ready? Who's ready to rock? No one. <laughs> Just Jesse. We, we are ready. We are. <laughs> yes. You got it? Thank you. Okay, you're good. I love how I, tall I, you are. I, I <laughs> rock it. I see you. I yeah. see you. All right. Thank you. Hi, honey. We're on set, so I'm going to have to call you back. New guest. I'm not sure she Skype wants to in. be, but. What do you think of this coming? <laughs> I think he'll be back in 30 yeah. seconds. Right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you think of that last one? <laughs> Good for you. Live long in blockchain.